You know, when you look around you and you see the condition of many Christians, if you are not convicted about the things of God and if you have not encountered God for yourself, you may begin to doubt the veracity of the gospel. The things Christians go through sometimes is so pathetic that you begin to wonder if the things the Bible say about God is really true. From his love, his benevolence, his power. But you see, when you examine the scripture, there is no challenge on the authority or the efficacy of scripture. In fact, in one of the one of the major topics in theology is the topic of the infallibility and inerrancy of scripture. It speaks about the inability of the scriptures to err. It speaks about the veracity of the word of God. And so everything the Bible says about God is true. The reason we don't manifest it most times is traceable to ignorance. And this is why teachings are very important. I'm telling you, if you go to the hospital today and you see the number of helpless and hopeless Christians, you will begin to wonder if the price on the cross is true and if how it is taught is so. But you see, the truth is, everything the Bible says is true. God cannot lie. And every scripture is the breath of God. So both the scripture and God are true. So Christians, believers, are going through what they are going through because of ignorance. If you look around you today and see the poverty of Christians who God has committed kingdom advancement to, you will wonder how they will ever advance the kingdom. Sometimes it appears as though we were set up when a global mandate was committed to us. Because the Bible made it clear. It said, my kingdom through prosperity shall yet be spread abroad. But when you see the hardship of Christians, many people barely have what to eat. How do you now talk about kingdom advancement? So you begin to wonder, is it true that God blesses? Is it true that salvation covers for our poverty? Does God really want to make us prosperous? Has God really made us prosperous? If it is true, why is so many of us walking largely in lack? If we take a census here tonight of those who have debts they need to pay, or of those who cannot even eat, you will be shocked. And so the question is, do we have a father who cares? And if he does care, does he have the ability to provide? If we take a census here tonight of those who are sick, you will be shocked the number of people who are having one or two health challenges. So does God really heal? Has he the power to heal? Or is the Bible a scam? The good news is that the Bible is not a scam. The Bible said, my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. God does not deny us. He said, we are still his people but the major reason we are destroyed is traceable to our ignorance. And everything God provides us is accessible on the platform of knowledge. He said in 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 3, According as his divine power had given us all things, not some, all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge, through the epignosis of him that has called us to glory and virtue. And when the Bible speaks of God's power, we are not just talking ability to do some things and not some things. God is omnipotent. Revelations 19, 6 said, the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Jesus said, is anything too hard for God to do? He said, with man is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. So it's according to the power that makes all things possible that we have been given all things that pertain to life and godliness. So power with God is not lacking. Provision is not lacking. We are not accessing because of ignorance. And so tonight, I want to advance spiritual precepts for prosperous living. And I pray 
that somebody will understand it and that somebody will engage it. Listen, whether you will remain where you are for the next five years or move to where you ought to be is a function of what you know and the degree to which you apply it. God has made it clear from scripture his desire for his children. In 3 John verse 2 is one chapter. It said, Beloved, this is Paul writing, John writing to the church and this is his salutation trying to give us the heartbeat of God. He said, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as your soul prospereth. This scripture alone gives us the full range of prosperity. Soul prosperity, which is growing in God, knowing God, living above sin, and then bodily prosperity, which is health, and then circumstantial and relational prosperity, which is the first thing he captures there. So in God's agenda, there is prosperity package for every component of your being. And so if there be any aspect of your life where you are not enjoying abundance, that is an alarm system that there is ignorance locking somewhere. And so we need to examine the scriptures again, particularly tonight, to find out how God prospers a believer. Now, for the purpose of my teaching tonight, I'm not going to touch um, soulish prosperity. I'm not going to touch bodily prosperity. I'm only going to touch material prosperity. But I'm laying this foundation so you will know that we know and we teach that prosperity is not materialism. Prosperity is first of all growing in the knowledge of God. That's why I said your soul, even as your soul prospered. Prosperity is living a healthy life. Victory over sickness. And then prosperity is having an impactful relationship with others. A life that impacts others. And then prosperity is also having circumstantial victory. That you are not walking in lack. But because we can't deal with all of that tonight. I just want to handle only material prosperity. But for the purpose of emphasis again. Let me state that spiritual prosperity is more important than bodily prosperity. And bodily prosperity is more important than circumstantial or material prosperity. In Mark 8, 36, Jesus speaking, he said, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and suffers the loss of his soul? That means, if you prosper materially and prosper bodily, but you don't know God or grow in God, all of that is a waste. However, it's also important to note that Jesus was not in any way trying to say bodily prosperity and material prosperity is not important. Because when you study the Bible, the same Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He said, and all other things shall be added unto you. In fact, the price that was paid for sin is the same price paid for your health and is the same price paid for your material prosperity in Isaiah chapter 53 from verse 4 see the way the Bible puts it it says surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted in verse 5 it says but he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities the chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes we were healed. So you see that same price paid for your sins is the same price paid for your healing. Peter reiterated it in 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 24. He said by his stripes you were healed. And Paul came back to add the third layer. In 1 Corinthians 8 9. He said for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The same grace that brought salvation. The same grace that brought healing. He said, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Rich as he was, he became poor that you and I might be made rich. 
and if you study the context of that scripture, he wasn't talking about the soul. Because Paul was talking about the church in Corinth. And the emphasis was about material resources. So he was talking about our material resources. So it's the same grace that deals with sin, that deals with sickness, and deals with material prosperity. So as far as God is concerned, he deals with poverty with the same severity with which he deals with sickness. And he deals with sickness with the same severity with which he deals with sin. The problem with a Christian is that when it has to do with sin, he puts on all his guard and he fights it with all his faith. But when it has to do with sickness, he lowers the, he lowers the standard. When it has to do with poverty, he lowers the standard. And that's why we are where we are. And so the emphasis of the teaching tonight is to let you know that you must prosper. Not just in your soul, but in your body and in your circumstances. But there is a protocol. Look at the first man that God created in the Garden of Eden. God gave him everything. He had relationship with God. He had health. He was working in divine health. And then he didn't have any lack. That is God's plan. So God wants you to grow in your relationship with him as much as he wants you to be healthy, as much as he wants you to have impactful relationships, and as much as he wants you to walk in material increase. Adam had it all. When he fell, he didn't just lose his relationship with God. He also lost everything. He lost health and he lost material resources. He was kicked out of the garden because the thing is a full package. God does not give one and leave one behind. When he gives one, he gives all. And when you lose one, you lose all. This is why many people who are burning for God, at some point they become frustrated. You know, some people think, oh, this thing, we are spiritual men. You are joking. When you talk, they say salvation is free. Try to take it to somebody and see how heavy it is. We are going to Kuje for a crusade. Those who will answer the altar call will say salvation is free and they are correct. Now, ask us who will take it there. We will tell you that the thing is expensive. Number one, Jesus paid the price. Number two, it costs millions to bring it here. This is why you cannot but prosper holistically. And this is why it's God's agenda. Some people say Jesus' death has nothing to do with material prosperity. That Jesus didn't come to prosper us. Really? If Jesus didn't come to prosper us, why then does he expect us to give for kingdom advancement? Where will we get it from? Would that be fair? If God has nothing to do with our prosperity, why will he expect us? The Bible said, cry out loud, Zacharias 1.17, and declare... My kingdom through prosperity shall yet be spread abroad. How does God expect us to take the kingdom to nations, to systems, to the whole earth, and to every generation? If he has no system of prospering us, do you think that gospel is correct? If we are handicapped, how can we advance kingdom? Whereas the Bible clearly states, it is the blessings of the Lord that make it rich. Proverbs 10.22 and added no sorrow to it. Paul was speaking in Philippians 4.19. He said, My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So through Christ, God supplies all your needs. Is your financial needs not part of your needs? How many, some of you need financial need, have, have financial need more than every other need. Do you know how many things we have used money for only today? So you cannot deny it. It's hypocrisy to deny it. And it is captured in God's plan. So we need to understand how to live prosperously. Number one, because the first man God created, he prospered him. Number two, because the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus covers your material prosperity. Number three, because the covenant also insists that you prosper. Now that I have mentioned the covenant, I need to establish a balance. You know, I told you on Tuesday that God is not in covenant with us. But we are children of the covenant, right? Hope you understand it. So the reason we practice covenant is to grow into maturity. Not because if we don't do it, we'll be cursed. Are you following this? And I gave you, okay, let me give you scriptures. Acts chapter 3 verse 25. I didn't plan to go very deep in that, but let me touch it. You are children of the prophets. 
and of the covenant which God has made with your fathers. This is the apostle writing to the Jewish people. Even the Jewish people, God already made them understand that this covenant is with Abraham. However, they were enjoying the benefits because of the covenant with Abraham. And they were practicing it because they were children of the covenant. Not necessarily because of them. However, they didn't understand the depths of that revelation. Now, when they were crying in Egypt and God showed up, he said, I have heard your cry from heaven by reason of your affliction and the pains of your tax masters. He said, therefore, I am come. And how did he introduce himself? The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. So is Abraham he had covenant with. However, because they didn't know anything about God's relationship and patterns. They were laboring under a lot of yokes and curses. So Paul came back in the New Testament and began to give them light. In Galatians chapter 3, Paul cancelled out the covenant of Moses and the covenant of Abraham in one scripture. In Galatians 3 verse 13 and 14, he began to teach us. He said, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. That For it is written, Cursed be everyone that hangeth on the tree, that the blessings of Abraham might come, not just to the Jews now, but to the Gentiles, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So our duty is to believe in the transaction that God had with the one he had covenant with. Are you following this? I'm trying to take you through a route. So Paul is telling us here that the way we come out of the yoke of the Mosaic covenant is to trust the one God had a covenant with and he captured it that it was Christ. But you will not see it in this scripture. If you read down to verse 26, 27, 28 and 29, you will now see what Paul said. He said, for you are the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Why is Paul emphasizing Christ? Because Christ was the one God had covenant with. Are you seeing this? He tried to have a covenant with Abraham. He couldn't keep it. He tried to have a covenant with Moses. Men couldn't keep it. He tried to have a covenant with David. They couldn't keep it. So God decided to have a representative among men. So God became man in Christ Jesus. And God kept the covenant. So we now become offsprings of the transactions that happened between God and Christ. This is why Christ was the one who paid the Mosaic covenant. By dying on the cross and removing the curse. You are now a product of that interaction. And then when he spoke about the Abrahamic covenant, he said, For as many of you that have been baptized in Christ, he said, You have put on Christ. You have put on the DNA of Christ. So Christ is your representative. You are in Christ. Your duty now is to receive the blessings. Verse 28, see the way he puts it. He said, There is neither Jew nor Greek. This thing is no longer about race anymore. He said, there is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. He said, for you are one in Christ Jesus. Verse 29. He said, and if you be Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heir according to the promise. What was he in, in, insinuating here? He's insinuating something. Jesus is the one who represents man in the covenant. And if you go into your scripture and you read from Galatians, I'll read another scripture. Okay, let me go to Hebrews. Hebrews, if you read Hebrews chapter 10, verse 16. Help me quickly. This is not my emphasis. Give me Hebrews 9.16. For where a testament is, there must of necessity be the death of the testator. Are you following this? Next verse. It says, For a testament is of is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength. Why the testator leave it? What is telling you here is that the covenant that God had with man was effected when Jesus paid the price in death. Because every one of us failed. We couldn't keep it. So Jesus came to keep it on our behalf. So he was the one who fulfilled the claims of divine justice. And it was at his death 
that he finalized the contract of the covenant. See, if you study covenants, you're going to find two things. The first thing about the covenant is that two parties must sign an agreement. And that agreement is bound by an oath. Now, when God signed that contract with Abraham in Genesis chapter 18, if you read from verse 6 to verse 18, you will discover that when the agreement was to be signed, Abraham didn't sign. The Bible said when it was evening, they cut the, the animal that they used for the covenant. Because the way they did it in ancient time is that you carry the animal, you divide it into two. So both parties will walk through. The blood will stain them as their oath. They are taking to keep the demands of the covenant. When time came for Abraham and God to walk through, only God walked through it. You know what God did there? He converted that covenant to a will. Because when it's a will, one person signs and the other persons enjoy the benefits. So the way the other person receives it is by believing. This is why Abraham didn't keep any rule. Abraham believed God. Because Abraham didn't sign the contract. Abraham, God alone signed the contract. So the covenant became a will. And then when Paul was talking about this same will, he said God was not talking to all the children of Abraham. In Galatians chapter 3, if you read from verse 15 to 16, he said God was talking about his child, which was Christ, one person. So Christ was the one that the promise was meant for. Now when Christ showed up, the covenant now reverted back to an agreement. So Christ had to keep the demands of justice. This is why Christ must die for sin. This is why everything God demanded Christ must do. And Jesus said, lo, it is written in the volumes of the book. I came to do thy will. Even when he was in the garden of Gethsemane, he said, if it were possible, let this cup pass me back. He said, yet not my will, but thine. Because now he needed to keep the covenant. It was not just a will for him. It was an agreement that he must keep. The moment Christ kept that agreement, the Bible said, every one of us who believe in Christ became the children of God. So God is not negotiating with us. And that's why I gave you an illustration of myself and my wife. I said, I was, I'm in covenant with my wife, but my son is the child of that covenant. My son is not swearing fidelity with me. I swore the oath of fidelity between myself and my wife. But my son is a product of the oath that we swore to ourselves. Are you seeing this now? If I give to my wife, it's a, it's a responsibility that the covenant mandates. But if I give to my son, it's a responsibility that love and fatherhood mandate. Are you following this? So my son did not sign any agreement with me. My son will only believe in me as his father. Now you now ask the question, which is why I'm dealing with this. Why then should my son practice the covenant? Because the transaction going on between me and my wife is based on mor moral values, which defines who we are. If my son does not practice it, he will not grow in morality. So I will not lie to my wife because the covenant negates it. I will not hide anything from my wife because the covenant negates it. I will not be unfaithful to my wife because the covenant negates it. When my son begins to grow, I will also teach him honesty. Not because he's following a rule, but because that must be his nature. If my son is growing, I will teach him fidelity. Not because if he's unfaithful, he will be cursed. But he has to learn fidelity because that's the character that defines our covenant. So for we who are Christians, we are not practicing covenant because if we don't, we'll be cursed. Jesus has taken the cost. We are not practicing covenant because if we don't, God will kill us. Jesus has already been killed. We are not practicing covenant because if we don't, we will fail. Jesus has already taken every shame on our behalf. But we are practicing the covenant now because it's the nature of God that defines the agreement. And if we don't practice the covenant, we will not grow to maturity. And if we don't grow to maturity, there are many things God cannot commit to us. Because in the new covenant, prosperity is an entrustment. And so God will entrust prosperity to you to the degree that you prove yourself mature in God. So God is in covenant with Christ. The Lord said to my Lord, sit down at my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. So the agreement was between the Father and the Son. But when Jesus died, I came out. When Jesus resurrected, I manifested. So I am the product of that covenant. This is why the Bible calls us heirs of the promise. Heirs of the promise. Heirs of salvation. 
heirs of the blessing. So we inherit it. Are you following this? I'm saying this to clear the ground. Because when I start talking about covenant practice, don't make the mistake of thinking from the line of Moses. That, oh, if I don't do this, I'm cursed. No, you are not cursed. Jesus has already been cursed. But if you don't do it, you are not mature. Things cannot be entrusted to you. Are you following this? Don't view this from the line of the law. That, oh, if I don't give, I am finished. Devourers, curses, famine. All of that doesn't work anymore. Jesus has taken it. But it's in your engaging it that God can trust you. Because now God knows you are mature to handle kingdom things. Because the covenant is also the character of God. That's what defines the agreement. Do you follow that? Does it make sense to you? So the Bible said we are what? Children of the covenant. That means we inherit God's blessings. We don't earn God's blessings. We inherit it. But everything we inherit is levels of maturity that determines our possession. Are you following this? Are you following this? The one who earned, the one who qualified, the one who passed the test of God was Jesus. But you have become an heir. Now that you are an heir, it belongs to you. However, it is maturity that determines it. Everything I have belongs to my son, but I can't give him everything now. If I give him the car now, he will kill himself. I can't give him certain amounts of money now. As I am now, I can give my son millions, but I can't give him now. What will he do with it? If I give him, he will implicate me. He can carry it and go out and start playing with it. And armed robbers will say, oh, there's money here like this. And they will cause damage. If I give him, he can even tear it. Something that should, you know why? Because it's not yet mature. That's why the Bible said the heir, so long as he's a child, is not different from a servant. So the point I'm making is that all the blessings of God are already yours. But most of us are children. So God cannot entrust us with kingdom wealth. It is God's plan, but it will take maturity to command it. The protocol I will teach you here are covenant-oriented protocols. But I need you to understand that the reason you engage them is because of maturity. Not because if you don't, you will be cursed. It's the man who is in covenant with God that if he doesn't keep it, that will be cursed. Not because if you don't, you will be killed. It's the one who is in covenant with God that if he doesn't, he will be killed. You are a child of that covenant. The reason you are keeping it is because the character of that covenant is your DNA now. So you're doing it is your growth in the things of the spirit. Does that make sense? So having explained this, let me go quickly to the protocol of prosperity. The protocol for prosperous living. This is what many Christians don't know. And this is why they struggle. If you know this and you engage this, you will prosper. And brothers and sisters, I beg you, prosper. You get why? If you don't prosper, even your conviction, you may lose it. Oh, I'm telling you, see, I've seen many people burning for God, but certain things happen, they began to question. Ah, ah, is this thing real? I've seen people before who were consistent with God. A point came, lack of transport fare made them to stop coming to church. There are many people who should have been here, they can't pay for their transport fare. And they cannot even buy data to watch it. Not because they don't love God. And because they can't transport themselves and can't afford data. After one month, the thing will no longer be in their heart. They will now replace it with something else. And before you know what is happening, they are in one corner smoking. And then you are wondering, how did you get here? Poverty brought him there. Not the devil. Lack brought him there. I've seen many people who went into wrong because they couldn't take it anymore. He can endure hunger. But he has a three year old child. Who is crying. And nobody is willing to help. He has no choice. He had to do something. That's why he stole for the first time. Not because of himself. But he can't see his child going through pains of hunger. See. Prosper my brother. He has a reason. Without prosperity you can't advance God's kingdom. Without prosperity, even your faith can be challenged. Without prosperity, you can't live a quality life. You cannot. And without prosperity, there are many things you can't do. See, there are many people burning with fire to win souls. They don't have the resources. They want to win more souls than we can ever imagine. But one crusade costs several millions. Several. Several. Several millions. 
So they cannot organize any massive event for God. Not because they don't have the heart. They don't have the means. This is why prosperity is a must. And this is why God puts it as part of our everyday life. We need to prosper. And don't prosper in a season. Don't prosper once in a while. Prosper always. There is a system that increases a man daily. Your prosperity should be daily. Daily. And there are forces in God that makes that happen. The question is, are you willing to engage them? There are two systems of material prosperity. Number one is the universal system. And then number two is the divine system. Universal system of prosperity cuts across three things. Number one, productive wisdom. If you don't produce anything, you can't prosper. Anybody you see today who has financial power is producing something. So this one, you don't have to need God. Universal prosperity is indirect empowerment of God. And the problem with universal prosperity is that man takes the glory. So for example, some of the billionaires in the world don't know God. But somebody has set up Facebook. Somebody has set up Twitter. Somebody has set up Apple. And every day millions come because you are using Apple. Because you are using Facebook. Because you are using Twitter. So long as you can produce something, you can prosper. And every one of us breathing must engage universal prosperity. I've taught you before that we relate with men at the level of men. But when operating at the level of men fail, then we shift to the God zone. That's the advantage we have. So we don't negate this. Please, as a Christian, let your hand do something. Even the Bible said, whatever your hand finds to do, it said, do it well. And the Bible said, the Lord will bless the works of your hands. So God has regard for what you do. What I'm about to teach you here does not encourage idleness. Anything your hand finds to do, that means your hand must find something. You must deploy yourself to producing something. Produce value. The information I'm giving you here is value. And there are things that come because of it. I've been in my room since 12 o'clock. I didn't go out of one room from 12 to 5. It took me 5 hours to cook what I'm giving you here. Somebody will hear this and say, wow, this is rich. And they will give me something because of it. It's called universal prosperity. Are you following? You must produce something. That's first law for universal prosperity. Number two is talents and gifts. Some people are struggling today because they are rusty. You have a voice. You think that voice is just to sing in your parlor. You are joking. God didn't give you your voice to sing in your parlor. You need wisdom to market your gift. Because a lot will depend on it. He say a man's gift maketh room for him. So if you don't manifest your gift, you have no room. The degree of empowerment you enjoy is the degree to the manifestation of your gift. And this one is not about God. God gave it generously to the whole creation. Because every flesh is an offspring of God. I was reading something yesterday and they said... A boxer fought for 20 minutes. Five minutes. The whole fight was for five minutes. And he made 50 million dollars. That's the that's gift. That's the excellency of gift. What a gift can give you in minutes. Hard work won't give you in a lifetime. 50 million dollars. Anthony Joshua. Five minutes of fight. Which, which institution can pay that? No one. Only gift and talent can pay that. I was told that people like Cristiano Ronaldo earn about 6,000 euros every minute. And I'm wondering, I tell you what he earns in a day. You can put all the professors in one school together, they won't earn it. That's the, I'm not a, see, hard work is good, but wise work is better. That's why <laughs> you need to deploy your gift. Don't joke with what I'm telling you. I'm, see, the giftings in this room, this room alone, is enough to sponsor Nigeria for 100 years. You know the problem? 98% of it is in a screwed state. And nothing crude has value. Even crude oil has no value. 
it is when it is refined that value comes out of it. There are many people sitting here that if they use their hand to do anything, you will wonder if it's a God that did it. There are many people here if they sing and you hear their voice, but the devil has put a cast on them so they never deploy that gift. And they are moving around begging and saying they are helpless. So when they approach God and say they are helpless, God is wondering, you are a good man. Who told you you are helpless? What you need is to refine it. And this is why you hear messages like this. To stir you to go back to what you have. You will be shocked. Look at Nigeria. How did we shift in the media world? Suddenly some boys emanated from worry and started making people laugh. And from making people laugh, laugh, they turned it to an organization. And today they are all millionaires. See, God is not taking the glory, but it's a universal prosperity. So that even the man who is godless can be blessed. That's the level of God's generosity. So he puts a gift in everybody. There is nobody seated here today who has no gift. And if that is the case, nobody here has an excuse to be poor. It doesn't matter the family you came from. You can be born poor. It's not your fault. But if you remain poor, you are the person to blame. Not even the devil. Because every one of us here is multi-gifted. The problem is we are not paying the price to refine it. Every time refining is in view, there is a lot of suffering and pain. If crude oil is to be refined, different products come out at different temperature. Petrol does not come out at the same temperature as butane. Butane comes out at a different temperature or the whole liquefied natural gas. They come out as a diff at a different temperature Petrol comes out at a different temperature. Diesel comes out at a different temperature. You know what that means? If you expose yourself to pressure, value will come out. But it's the degree to which you expose yourself that will determine what comes out. So somebody may have diesel, petrol, bitumen, and liquefied natural gas. He will produce only diesel. And his life will operate at the level of diesel. If you want more influence, if you want more glory, expose yourself to more pressure. It may take hours of reading. It may take years of mentoring. It may take years of study. It may take years of apprenticeship. But by all means, put yourself under that pressure. Every pressure refines you. And your gift becomes sharper. I've taught you before, Gentiles come to your light. But kings, they don't care about your light. It is the brightness of your rising. So your gift must make you stand out for you to command certain level of influence. And then number three, under universal prosperity is heritage. There are many people in the world who have no gift. They have no wisdom. They are producing nothing. But their father produced something. So you see them driving a Ferrari. You say, what do you do? He says, it's my father's wealth. He will pay you, but there's nothing you can do. You are not the man's son. It's DNA that makes that one happen. It's my father's wealth. He wakes up, they say, they call those ones those born with silver spoon. So if you are not born with silver spoon, begin with what? Productive wisdom and then go to what? Sharpening your giftings and talents. These things are very important. But they are called what? Universal system of prosperity. See, they are good. Except that in the universal system of prosperity, God does not take the glory. And what is the importance of what you have? If God will not take the glory. If you are the one taking the glory for what you have. That does not impact your eternity. That means you will be wealthy in time. But poor in eternity. Did you read the story of the wise fool? The guy applied all the principles of productivity. He said now my barn is filled. I have to rest. And find rest for my soul. And heaven addressed him. You fool. So anybody who engages only universal prosperity is a fool. You know why? He has no wealth in eternity. He said tonight your soul will be demanded of you. And he was caught up. The guy who had abundance on earth was looking for a drop of water in eternity. So you can be rich on earth and poor in the world to come. And so in order for you to be both wealthy on earth and wealthy in eternity is the reason why you also have to apply divine prosperity system. Because God also has his own system. The difference between divine prosperity and universal prosperity is that 
in universal prosperity, God's enablement is indirect. So God can put a talent in you. You may never meet God, but you discover that talent. God can put you in a nation where things are working. And then you study, refine your mind, get a good you know, opening and begin to prosper. God is indirectly involved. Whereas in divine prosperity, God is directly involved. The second difference is that in universal prosperity, man takes the glory. But in divine prosperity, only God takes the glory. Because you are applying the principles of God. And tonight, I want to share with you quickly on the protocol for divine prosperity. Or protocol for prosperous living. There are five things I have outlined here. That if you do, you must prosper. If you do. And you will not just prosper, but your prosperity will ascribe glory to God. Number one protocol of divine prosperity is to clearly identify God as your source. I have a talent, but my talent is not my source. I have a job, my job is not my source. The psalmist said in Psalm 23 from verse 1, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. This is the source. Now, I've taught you before, hope you know this guy talking is a warrior. He can go to war and come back with spoils of war. Hope you know this guy talking is a king. The whole wealth of the nation belongs to him. But he was smart. It is not my battle skill that prospers me. It is not my kingship that prospers me. The Lord is my shepherd. Now why do you think he oppressed like this? Read the scripture to the end. You will know why he decided to choose God. And not any other thing. See verse 2. He maketh me lie down in green pasture. So he's telling you that there's a force that creates opportunity for me. I don't have all the wisdom to create all the opportunities I need in life. The opportunities that come my way, some of them I don't deserve it. But it is that God who is my source that makes me to lie in green pasture. Number two, he said he leadeth me beside the still waters. That means I am wealthy with peace. I am not wealthy with pressure. I am not wealthy with turbulence. The kind of wealth I have is one that comes with peace. Remember the Bible said, it is the blessings of the Lord that make it rich and added no sorrow. That means many other types of blessings exist but they come with sorrow. This is why you find wealthy men today. They are looking for women to sleep with every night. They are looking for drinks, alcohol to take every night. They are looking for a place to go on vacation by all means. They are gambling. They want to do something because they can't manage the pressure in the soul. Today, there is this. Tomorrow, there. So there is turbulence. But a man whom God is his source, he leads him beside the still waters. There is a peace that you cannot explain. The Bible said that peace surpasses knowledge. Go to verse 3. He restored my soul. You see what this prosperity costs? This type of prosperity makes you turn to God. There are other prosperity that make you turn away from God. Have you seen people who prosper by their giftings? You see loftiness, you see pride, you see arrogance. The more wealthy they become, the more godless they become. But if it's God that sources you, the more wealthy you are, the closer you are to God. Because what he's doing is not just in your bank account, it's first of all in your soul. He restored my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his namesake. So there's a prosperity that makes a man holy. It's not every wealthy man that is a ritualist. It's not every wealthy man that is godless. It's not every wealthy man that is a gambler. It's not every wealthy man that is a womanizer. The men that God prospers, they walk in the path of righteousness. Oh, let's go to Job. Job 22. Read from verse 21 to 29. I'll come back to this scripture. See the way the Bible paints it. Acquaint now thyself with him and be at peace. Thereby good shall come unto you. So you are not pursuing good. It's coming to you. Because you have acquainted yourself with him. See verse 22. Take it all to 29. He said, Receive I pray thee the law from his mouth. And lay up his words in thy heart. Next verse. If thou return to the almighty. Thou shalt be built up. And thou shalt put away iniquity 
from thy tabernacle. Verse 24. And thou shalt lay up gold as dust and the gold of offer as the stones of the brook. You know what that means? Do you know what it means to keep dust away from a place? Clean a table now. Come back five minutes. Dust is already there. Clean it again. Five minutes later. Dust is already there. So there is a type of prosperity that pursues you. It's the prosperity that leads you in the path of righteousness. He said you will lay up. See, somebody will lay up dollars as dust. See, when we are talking wealth, it's not I have 10 million, I have 20 million. It's not every month. I'm talking as you are sleeping, money is coming. As you are going about, money is coming. You wake up, you meet money, you sleep, money is still coming. There is a realm like that. And there are many operating like that. He said you shall what? Lay up gold as dust. This is the prosperity the psalmist is talking about. And this is how it is if God is the one blessing you. Go back to Psalm 23 verse 4. That's not all. He said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. So there is a prosperity that defies season. When every other person is failing, you can't. You can't fail. You don't have seasons of failure. Your move does not fluctuate. It goes up and up only. Why? Because thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Are you seeing why this guy did not choose the prosperity that comes from a warrior? Are you seeing why this guy did not choose the prosperity that comes from a king? Are you seeing why this guy did not choose the prosperity that comes from a gift? But the one that God is the source. Because if your gift, if it is gift based prosperity, if it is production based prosperity, if it is talent based prosperity, if you enter the valley of the shadow of death, you are finished. This is why many billionaires crash. Because when they enter the valley of the shadow of death, see there is a place where money can't talk. Only the presence of God can make the difference. Money is important, but the channels your life will take you through. Some of them, money will be helpless. Did you not read that in Egypt, money failed? So when you come to that point where your wisdom can't work, your connection can't work, if God is your source, then he will rise up for you. And say, even in the valley of the shadow of death, I still bless. The guy didn't stop here. He went further. Verse 5. He said, Thou preparest a table before me, in the presence of my enemies. See, there's a prosperity that doesn't care who likes you or who hates you. They can gang up against you. You are going forward. They can support you. You are going forward. This is why the Bible said, all things work together for good. See, before you quote scriptures, know why. All things will work together for good for you if God is your source. If you love God, if you are called according to his purpose. I'm showing you why Christians quote scriptures yet they sink. Because there's a difference between quoting scriptures and knowing truth. A man who does not recognize God as his source is singing, the Lord is my provider. When things now go wrong, he say, Lord, why? This is why. The prosperity that comes from God is one that insists that God must be the source. That means you give glory to God for what you have. Not your talent. Not your wisdom. Not your hard work. All of those things will be in place. And that's why I told you to start from there. However, you know that if it is for your talent alone, you won't be where you are. I was talking with my wife this morning and I just shook my head. The same thing I'm doing, I've been doing for the past 10 years is what I'm doing now. I've not changed it. Same thing, this gospel that I'm preaching. Apart from maybe I was teaching and receiving some peanuts which I've stopped. Which is supposed to have reduced my capacity. Same thing for the past 10 years. But you know what? What I have given from January to March, I have not given it in 10 years. That means the first three months of this year, I have prospered more than I have prospered in 10 years. See, there's no way to explain it. Not because I, I went and did a new deal. I went and broke the same thing. But there's a way God works. The more you grow in faithfulness, the more he multiplies it. And then you see that capacity is increasing, resources are increasing. Not because you have become super creative. He is just remaining your source. You are giving him more glory. 
you are believing more in him you are walking more with him and you see that unexplainably things are just happening and the way God works by the time I get to December I would have gone now if I say what I've given in 3 months is more than what I've given in 10 years I hope you know that the last 10 years is more important than the last 20 or 25 years of my life so I'm trying to tell you that what I've done in 3 months is more than what I've done in the lifetime by what means the economy is becoming harder and harder and so when things go bad you just feel for others as much as you can you help them but not you because the water that destroyed the world is the water that lifted the ark it depends on where you are standing <laughs> when, when, when people are going through hardship we feel for them we support them as much as we can but not us because what we are working with even in the valley of the shadow of death we prosper in the presence of our enemies we prosper I have fought more battles in the last 3 years than I fought in the last 10 years I didn't notice because the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want many don't know see no one blesses like God he says the blessings of God that make it rich and add that no sorrow to it Proverbs 10 22 Philippians 4 19 say my God supplies not some of my needs all my needs see even the, when the Bible say all your needs it's not the ones you know because there are many needs you have that you don't know so when he say all your needs even the ones you don't know he supplies it but the key is for God to be your source and this thing is not just about talking it's about consciousness because your life will show it if you have something and it makes you too busy to come to God's presence that thing has become your God if you have something and it makes you too busy to pray that thing has become your source so a man who says God is his source makes God his priority nothing takes the place of God that's the meaning of this scripture even as a king David was going to the tabernacle to pray daily because the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want the first key for prosperity is to make God your source you know the question Jesus asked them in Luke twenty-two thirty-five. 35 he said when I sent you out without purse without script without sanders did you lack anything and the people say no we lack nothing if God is involved there will be no lack the reason we are suffering lack is because God is not our source so the first protocol for divine prosperity is to make God your source and prove it in your life if that becomes the case it's over the devil has failed no matter what happens where you are or who rises up against you or whatever plans it will fail on arrival I don't care if anybody carries my name to a shrine I don't have time to pray for such things take my name there see what will appear that's when you will know who powers me see there are some prayers we don't pray the reason you pray some prayers is because God is not the one behind you if he's the one powering you let them curse you let them take your name to a shrine let them gang up against you they will not see you it's the one that defends you that will rise he said there's no enchantment against Jacob there's no divination against Israel is it because Israel is praying no he said the shout of the king is in their midst when you rise up against a man God defends it's God that rises if you if there's a security system in your house and thieves come will you the one that will show up are you the one to show up it's the security system that will respond God is my keeper and so when a man wants to fight me he will fight God first before he comes to me because he's my keeper he's my defender and the reason God is so is because I made him my source most of us have not made God our source that's why it's difficult for us to obey that's why it's difficult for us to create time for him and that is the root of our poverty the second protocol for prosperous living please hear this and make decisions there are most of us here our jobs don't let us pray you are the one I'm talking to there are most of us here our businesses don't let us evangelize there are most of us here it's been long we stayed in God's presence and even if somebody invites us we are checking our watch ah, I have a meeting I have this you are joking you will do well until you come to the valley of the shadow of death that's where human connection fails that's where money fails God help you that he shows up 
if he doesn't show up for you, then you will see how pathetic. Have you not seen the wealthiest men in split second circumstances sweep them off? Number two, the way the system of prosperity works is that you connect to it by faith. You are the one to connect to it. It won't connect to you. When electricity is made available, you wire it to your house. That's how the system of God works. You connect to that system. He makes it available universally and he makes it available divinely for his children. But it is those who connect to it by faith that we enjoy it. And most of us never connect to God's system. Matthew 9, 29. Jesus speaking, he said, Be it done to you according to your faith. I can do all things. But what will happen to you is not according to what I can do. It's according to your faith. So how much you can draw from God is the faith that you can exercise. Most of us don't know that everything we ever require has already been made available. What we are enjoying now is the one our faith can carry. So this prayer of bless me, bless me, bless me without taking faith-based initiative is a waste of time. Have you not been praying it for more than five years? Ask those who are prospering. They will tell you. See, the problem we have is those who don't have the experience are the ones trying to justify it. So every time you are talking about the blessings of God is the poor that are arguing that this thing doesn't work. All this thing is manipulation. All these things is uh, 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 fanatism. Oh God, how much do you have? Those who have don't argue. It's working for them. When God told Moses to tell the children of Israel to give, the Bible said they gave daily. You know why? When they gave and saw the result, they came back. This thing works. So they add some more. And they go and come back and keep doing it. Those who are doing it, why do you think they are not stopping? You think it's because you are wiser than them. They are seeing results that are supernatural. So they know that this thing has power. This is why they are connecting and they keep connecting by faith. Mark 9.23 All things are possible, not only to God. You know the Bible says with God all things are possible. But as you begin to walk in faith, you will now discover... It's not only with God that all things are possible. Jesus said, all things are possible to them that believe. So any area of your life where faith comes alive, you will see results. I was telling Pastor Godwin some, uh, some days ago, I said, the reason we command results in the area of holiness, purity, righteous living, fire for God, is because that's what we emphasize. And if we keep emphasizing it, after 10 years, some people will die of sickness. Some people will die of poverty. Because it will not be in their consciousness. And so they will not deploy faith in that area. If you say, let's pray now. We can pray from now till tomorrow morning. It's when we are sweating. That's when we charge. When you think, oh, these people should go and eat. No, that's when the fire go up. So we have built capacity in the area of prayer. We have built capacity. See, there are some of us here in this meeting, seated among you here. If you like being naked, they will look at you and say, get out. You are not serious. The appetite does not exist. They are not trying to keep themselves. No, they have deadened that appetite in God's presence. There are many people here, try to bribe them. They will be angry with you. The holy fire in them is intense. But if you bring a challenge of 40,000, they will crash. So a man who is tall like a cherubim in, in, in holiness, tall like a cherubim in prayer power cannot deal with an issue of 40,000. 40,000 is like a mountain to him. You know why? He doesn't know how to walk the faith that commands financial result. There are many people who can pray and bring down a building. Somebody has headache. They are shaking. They have prayed everywhere is shaking. You say this brother can't hear on his left ear. They say, eh, what happened? Okay, let's pray for him later. Oh guys, not later, it's now. The Bible says now faith is. Which one is later? The God who can do it later, can't he do it now? You know what? They don't have faith for health. The moment they feel any pain here, and you say, ha, is he us, sir? They say, oh, I don't know. Oh, baba, baba, hey, baba. Oh, 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 oh. That prayer is fear. They don't have faith for it. So you see the guy is holy but sick. He is holy but poor. 
Because the way the system works is you address each with specific protocol. 